Hey, welcome back. Today we're going to be talking through how to solve vertical circular motion problems like with a roller coaster for physics and AP physics classes. So we're going to be addressing questions like how do you solve for the normal force at the bottom of the loop of a roller coaster? I'm also going to talk about the forces at the top of the loop of a roller coaster. And we're also going to address the idea of how many G's does a rider experience on the roller coaster at the bottom of the loop. And we've got some given values over here for our roller coasters. So let's see how this is done and see how to address these types of problems. So the very first question was, how do you solve for the normal force at the bottom of the loop of the roller coaster? So here's a quick diagram. I'm going to assume up is positive and down is negative here. And so if we were going to draw a free body diagram in the y-axis here and just think about what's happening in the y, we've got a force due to gravity and a normal force in the same plane. So I can go ahead and start with the sum of the force strategy up there. I'll put a link to the sum of the forces strategy if you don't know what I'm talking about, but basically it's two lines and I will demonstrate it here where you literally add up the sum of the forces in that axis. And then the second line is Newton's second law right over here. And then you set them equal to each other. Now, I am also going to be subbing in for the force due to gravity mg. You can directly jump to this if you want. Make this negative because it's pointing downwards. Before you set them equal to each other, though, this is really important. This is how we change things up when we're dealing with the circular motion problem. We need to think of this as having centripetal acceleration. Really crucial that this you change over. The overall acceleration of the y must be equal to that centripetal acceleration equation. Now there are two different variants. There's one with linear variables and one with radian based units. And so I'm going to show you the one with the linear variables and linear units here. So we're going to say this is tangential speed squared over radius. We're going to sub that in, set these two equations equal to each other. So let me show you what that looks like here. And the next thing we're going to do, all we need to do is look for the normal force at the bottom here. So we're going to look for the normal force and at this point, you could plug in your numbers if you wanted to and solve for the normal force. And I want you to think about what that means. The normal force here has to overcome the weight of the object, plus it has to be strong enough of a force to cause this object to be moving in a circular path. In other words, it has to cause the object to have centripetal acceleration here. All right, so let's take that and move on. We'll compare them again later in a moment. But first, I do want to address this issue of how many Gs a writer experiences. So you may have heard that before. A g is just a multiple of our gravitational acceleration we experience here on the Earth. So if a pilot in an experimental airplane is undergoing, say, 8 g's or something like that, that means that pilot is experiencing 8 times our gravitational acceleration on his or her body. And so that can be kind of intense. That can cause people to pass out. It doesn't mean they're not tough. It just means that the blood goes out of the front of their brain. If they're accelerating in the forward direction, they don't have enough blood in the front of their brain to continue to function normally and they can end up passing out. Okay so we can take that work we did at the bottom of the roller coaster here and knowing that the number of g's experienced is going to be the acceleration that's experienced divided by our acceleration due to gravity. Therefore we can go ahead and plug in some numbers here and think about what we end up with. The number of g's that this person would experience would be 5.39 g's at the bottom of a roller coaster. So engineers who do this kind of thing, who design roller coasters, need to be careful, right? Like the more intense the experience, the more dangerous it can be as well. So there's always a trade-off with engineers, and they have to be very careful with the number of Gs experienced. If you make the G value too high, you can actually have people have problems with their back as a result of your ride. And you don't want that happening. You make it too boring and people don't like it. All right, so let's go ahead and take a look at the normal force at the top of the loop here. So this is going to be different, but the strategies we're going to employ are going to be the same. You draw the free body diagram at the top. Notice now both of those forces are going in the same direction. And so then we just make them both negative here. Again, I'm going to sub in for the force due to gravity. You can do that on the first go round if you like. And then we say, well, this is Newton's second law. That's the second line for the sum of the forces strategy. We will set them equal to each other. But remember, this is moving in a circular path here. So as a result, that acceleration needs to be changed over. That's what I'm doing right here, changing this to centripetal acceleration. So the overall acceleration in the y-axis must be equal to that centripetal acceleration equation. It must be the case. So we go ahead and take that and we set them equal to each other, subbing in for your force due to gravity here. And this is what we end up with. 
And then really important, I want you to notice that I make this acceleration negative. If you forget to do this, you will throw off the problem because that acceleration has a vector to it. So do not forget that negative symbol for these types of problems. Really crucial to remember this. One more thing I want to point out, notice that we have a negative term in all three of these terms. And so you can multiply a negative one through and make that positive, isolate for your FN, and you're going to end up with a different answer than what we had at the bottom of the loop. So let's go ahead and compare the two and think about what's going on here. So at the bottom of the loop of the roller coaster, the normal force must overcome the weight of the rider or the weight of the car, and it must be enough of a force to cause this object, either the rider or the car, to move in a circular path. That's what this is saying. So your normal force is gonna be greatest at the bottom, and then the normal force at the top it has to be great enough to cause this thing to move in a circular path, subtracting the weight. So in other words, what would happen, what would happen if the weight was exactly equal to the amount of force it takes to move this object in a circular path? What do you think? If, if these two terms were exactly equal, what would that mean for the normal force at the top of the loop? Well, the normal force at the top of the loop would actually be zero. That is possible to have a loop where that is the scenario where you could have a problem, for instance, that would say, what would be the speed that this object would need to travel around in a loop such that the normal force was the smallest amount possible? It is actually possible to get a zero on a normal force. So there was a roller coaster in Southern California where I grew up called the Ghost Rider, and you would have things like this happen where the normal force that you experience is less than the normal force that you normally experience. So you feel somewhat weightless as you go around in a loop or over a well-designed hill because you sense the seat. The seat is pushing on you when you're on these rides. And if that push on you is less than what you're expecting or no push at all, then you are feeling as if you're weightless as you fly through the air, kind of like a projectile, so to speak. So a lot of interesting physics going on with roller coasters at amusement parks, and hopefully you've had the opportunity to enjoy that. In any case, I do hope you've enjoyed this lesson as well. Hopefully that has helped you to understand what you need to understand for your classes. Just note that I am doing this for all of the major topics for a regular and for an AP Physics C Mechanics class as well. So if you have any comments or questions down below, please let me know, and I hope you all have a great day. Take care.